Okay, we're going to look at the abomination of desolation. It says uh, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. That tells us right up front, we can understand what the abomination of desolation is. And we should understand it. Mark 13 says similarly, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. And then Luke 11, 21 and 20 says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. The Greek, the Greek translation of uh, abomination of desolation could be translated the abomination that makes desolate. And I think that speaks a little bit clearer. Now, I'm, I'm going to be covering an awful lot of information in this session. You have notes, and it would be good for you to try to follow along with the notes um, because it's, it's going to be a lot. Um, the word abomination is defined as a thing that causes disgust or hate. Uh, synonyms for it are uh, disgrace, atrocity, horror, obscenity, revulsion, disgust, disdain. That's what the word abomination means. It's uh, disgusting. To understand this important topic without getting too uh, gross, or macabre, we will look at three historical events and one future event. We're going to look at three historical events, things that have already happened, and one that's going to happen yet in the future. That uh, on the slide here, the, the first will be the Solomon's Temple and the desolation that happened by the Babylonians in 587 to 586 BC. The second thing we'll look at is the second temple, the desolation by Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 BC. The third temple is the one we were just talking about that Jesus was around when Jesus' time. The desolation of that happens with the Romans in 70 AD and 135 AD. Uh, and then in, in, uh, the fourth one will be the desolation by the beast. That's the last tyrant ruler at the end of and during the end times, he will destroy the temple again. He will be responsible for building it, and he'll be responsible for destroying it. Solomon's temple, again, as I, I said in a previous session, was to be the holiest place on earth, a place where God would be worshipped and where his people would connect with him. There are many pages in the Bible that are dedicated to the original temple, to its building, to its dedication, to its, to its services, and to its destruction. The temple was built as Yahweh instructed and was accepted by Yahweh by fire. I mean, it was, it was nothing, I mean, God was pleased with this. God signified it when, it, when, the, when the temple was dedicated. When, when Solomon dedicated the temple, he offered an extraordinary amount of animals in sacrifice. It's, the numbers are hard to even believe. Uh, there's so many animals that were destroyed. And here's an artist's rendition of that. You can see, I guess, the one with his arms up in the air would be Solomon. And to his uh, side there is the fire with the animals burning. And after these, the sacrifice of all of these things, then this artist's rendition where the fire of God came down and accepted the offering and the sacrifice and the dedication of the temple. God put his undeniable seal on it. This is my holy place. And it was what God wanted. The destruction of uh, Solomon's temple and Jerusalem occurred before Daniel's prophecy. You remember Jesus said the abomination of desolation that is Daniel talked about. The first one I want to talk about is not, it happened before Daniel, but it sets a precedent to understand what happens that Daniel is talking about. 
and what Jesus is talking about. It's the destruction of the first temple. There's more information on that than the other two destructions. And you'll see as we go along how this is relevant. The eschatological prophecies are often repeated more. They, they're often about more than one event. There's it, the end times in prophecy is very frequent in the Old Testament. We, as you study uh, that, it, it's prophesying about more than one event. And such is the case here with the abomination of desolation. It happened three times, and it's going to happen a fourth time. Um, in the destruction of Solomon's temple, uh, in six, well, so in 601 B.C., Jehoiakim was the king of Judah, and he stopped paying tribute to Nebuchadnezzar, and he took a pro-Egyptian stand or position at that time. It talks about this in 1 Kings 24. So again, Jehoiakim. Now, now what, what's going on in the world is the Babylonians pretty much own the world, and they, they, Israel has been conquered by the Babylonians. Now, Jehoiakim is the king, and instead of going along and paying the taxes and the tribute money that Nebuchadnezzar wanted, he didn't pay it. He decided to go with the Egyptians who had not yet, who were still standing against the Babylonians. A bad decision. Look at Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah talks about this time, and he, he warned Jehoiakim not to do this, that it would be uh, very detrimental. In Jeremiah chapter 25, Jeremiah chapter 25, the word came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. That was the first year Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Verse 2, 25-2 which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, For from the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, these twenty-three years, the word of Yahweh has come to me, and I have spoken to you again and again, but you have not listened. Twenty-three years, you haven't listened. Yahweh sent me Yahweh has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, again and again, but you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear, saying, Turn now everyone from his evil way. This is what the prophet said. This is what Jeremiah said. Turn now everyone from his evil way, from the evil of your deeds, and dwell on the land which Yahweh has given you and your forefathers forever and ever. And do not Go after other gods to serve them and to worship them. And do not provoke me to anger with the work of your hands. And I will do you no harm. Yet you have not listened to me, declares Yahweh. In order that you might provoke me to anger with the work of your hands to your own harm. Therefore, thus says Yahweh of hosts. Because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares Yahweh, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants and against all these nations round about, and I will utterly destroy them and make them a horror and a hissing and an everlasting desolation." Moreover, I will take from them the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones, the light of the lamp. This whole land will be a desolation and a horror. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will be taken, they will be taken away for 70 years and so on. It goes from there. So what, what Jeremiah warned them about indeed happened. Again, before we proceed, what we just read was, it was Israel's refusal to listen to Yahweh and maintain monotheism. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is God, Yahweh is one. They refused to believe that, 
And he said to them, okay, well, this is now what's going to happen to you. What set the, abom the desolation was the abomination they committed was idolatry. And, and he said, my servant uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't tell Nebuchadnezzar to destroy them like he did. He just let Nebuchadnezzar do what the Babylonian king would do in conquering any land. And uh, that's exactly what ends up happening. So in 597 BC, Nebuchadnezzar attacks Jerusalem. Jehoiakim died during the siege and was succeeded by his 18-year-old son, uh, Jeconiah, his 18-year-old son. The city fell about three months later. Nebuchadnezzar pillaged both Jerusalem and the temple, carrying its spoils back to Babylon. Je um, Jeconiah, his family, and his court, with all the prominent citizens, including craftsmen, were marched off to Babylon. About 10,000 people were deported from the land and dispersed throughout the Babylonian Empire. This is when we believe Ezekiel was, and maybe when uh, Daniel and, uh, and his companions were, or, or at least at another time. Nebuchadnezzar installed Jehoiachin, I mean, Jeconiah's uncle. Nebuchadnezzar installed Jeconiah's uncle, a 21-year-old Zedekiah. Look how young these guys are. Zedekiah was a vassal king. Zedekiah is the brother of uh, Jehoiakim. He's Jehoiakim's brother because he's Jeconiah's uncle. So, so he's the king. He's a, he, as a, a vassal king, he owes his allegiance to the other king. The, that would be the ba Nebuchadnezzar. However, despite the strong warnings of Jeremiah, uh, some of we just read, but also in chapter 27, and others, Zedekiah revolted against Nebuchadnezzar by ceasing to pay tribute to him and entered an alliance with Pharaoh. He repeated the same foolish mistake of Jehoiakim, his brother. So Nebuchadnezzar t returns to Jerusalem a second time, again, this time to completely destroy it. Many Jews fled for refuge into the surrounding countries of Moab, Ammon, and Edom. The city was under attack for 30 months with no water or food entering therein. Lamentations describes the horror that took place. Lamentations chapter 4. The tongue of the infant cleaves to the roof of, of its mouth because of thirst. Little ones are ask, ask for bread but no one breaks it for them. Those who ate delicacies are desolate in the streets. Those reared in purple embrace ash pits. Those, the royalty, the wealthy ones. Better are those slain with the sword than those slain with hunger, for they pine away being stricken for lack of the fruits of the field. The hands of compassionate women boiled their children, their own children. They became food for them because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. The city fell in the 11th year of Zedekiah's reign. Nebuchadnezzar broke through Jerusalem's wall, walls. He conquered the city. Zedekiah and his followers attempted to escape, but were captured on the plains of Jericho and taken to Ripnatla. There, after seeing his sons killed, Zedekiah was blinded, bound, and taken captive to Babylon, where he remained as a prisoner until his death. After the fall of Jerusalem, the Babylonian general Nebuzaradan Nebir was sent to complete its destruction. Jerusalem was plundered. Solomon's temple was destroyed. Most of the elite were taken captive. Maybe this is when Daniel and his companions were taken, which is spoken of in the book of Daniel. The city was abolished. Only a few people were permitted to remain to tend to the land. This was indeed a time of great desolation for Jerusalem, similar to what Daniel will speak about and Jesus will prophesy about the abomination of desolation. 
The book of Ezekiel describes the abomination that preceded this desolation. Jeremiah spoke for Yahweh in Jerusalem, while his contemporary Ezekiel spoke for Yahweh while he was in Babylon. Ezekiel was among the first taken captive to Babylon. So in the sixth year of his captivity, this is the revelation that he received. Are you with me? In Ezekiel chapter 8, he, Yahweh's messenger, stretched out the form of a hand and caught me by the lock of my hair. And the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court where the seat of the idol of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy, was located. So uh, these guys, when they got visions, they were, they were something else. I mean, he got pulled and taken to the temple. And now he's, and behold, the glory of Yahweh of Israel was there, like the appearance which I saw in the plain. And he said to me, Son of man, rise your eyes now toward the north. So I rose, I raised my eyes towards the north, and behold, the north of the altar gate was this idol of jealousy at the entrance. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations, you can underline abominations as we're going through here, which the house of Israel are committing here. This is in the temple, so that they would be far from my sanctuary. But yet you see still greater abominations. Then he brought me to the entrance of the court when I looked, behold, a hole in a wall, he said, Son of man, now dig through the, hole, the wall. So I dug through the wall, and behold, an entrance. And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked, wicked abominations that they are committing here. So I entered and looked, and behold, every form of creeping things and beasts and detestable things with all the idols of the house of Israel were carved on the wall all around. In this holy place, standing in front of them were 70 elders of the house of Israel, the ruling body of Israel, the leader that had devised iniquity and gave evil advice was there. The son, uh, the grandson of, this was uh, Jaz, J. Aniah, the son of Shaphan. Um, Standing among them, each man with a censer in his hand and the fragrance of the cloud of incense rising. Then he said to me, Son of man, do you see what the elders, the 70 elders of the house of Israel are committing in dark? Each man in the room of his carved images. They say, Yahweh does not see us. Yahweh has forsaken the land. And they say to me, yet you will see still greater abominations which they are committing. Then he brought me to the entrance of the gate of Yahweh's house, which was toward the north, and behold, women were sitting there weeping at Tamos, the god, that's the god of fertility. And he said to me, do you see this son of man? Yet you see still greater abominations than these. Then he brought me to the inner court of Yahweh's house, and behold, at the entrance of the temple of Yahweh, before the porch at the altar were, were about 25 men with their backs to the temple of Yahweh, their faces towards the east. They were prostrating themselves eastward towards the sun. In the temple of God, they're worshiping the sun. He said to me, do you see this, son of man? Is it too light a thing for the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they have committed here? They have filled the house with violence and provoked me repeatedly. For behold, they are putting a twig to their nose. Idolaters carried twigs in their hands and put them in their noses in honor of the idol they worshipped, a sign of humility. Therefore I, therefore, I indeed will deal in my wrath. My eye will have no pity, nor will I spare. And... And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet I will not listen to them. Ezekiel 9 reveals that everyone in the city, everyone in the city except for Ezekiel was an idol worshiper. Chapters 10 and 11 of Ezekiel show that Yahweh 
takes his glory from the temple. He removes his glory from the temple. He removes his glory from Jerusalem, never to return again. That, well, still not yet has returned. That glory was not on the temple of Herod. So Yahweh went up from the midst of the city and stood over the mountain, which is east of the city, and that is the Mount of Olives, where Jesus will return. The prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, revealed the reasons behind the desolation of the temple at Jer and Jerusalem, which were idolatrous abominations. I, they were idolaters. They were, uh, they, they were disgusting. They were reviled. They, they did all of this in the holy house of Yahweh. It's like a wife having sex with another man in, his, in her husband's house while he is watching. That's what he equated it to in Ezekiel. It's, that's what they did to him. And then, hence the desolation that followed. Deuteronomy 7, 25 and 26 says, the graven images of that, this was written by Moses way before all of this. And I should tell you this, every king was, was supposed to read the, the Torah. They were supposed to read the first five books of the Bible. So uh, Jeconiah, uh, Zedekiah, all of these guys should have read this and known this, but they apparently did not. Deuteronomy 7 says, The graven images of their gods you are to burn with fire. You shall not covet their silver or gold that is on them, nor take it for yourselves, or you will be snared by it, for it is an abomination to Yahweh your God. You shall not bring an abomination into your house and like, and like it come under the ban. You shall utterly detest it and you shall utterly abhor it for it is something to be banned. And yet look at how far removed it had gotten. So cheery stuff, right? It's important to note that Israel's disobedience and the idolatrous ways were the abomination that caused the desolation. And there were three phases to the complete desolation. If you remember, Nebuchadnezzar attacked twice, and then the third time he sent his general, and he completely destroyed it. So there were three phases to it, which is relevant when we go forward and see the other abominations of desolations that take place. So, um, you know, this old guy um, lost his hat and uh, he's looking all over for it. He can't find his hat. So not being a good guy, he decided he was going to go to church and steal a hat out of the coat room. So he goes to church and uh, not, he wasn't planning on this. There was an usher at the door that met him and greeted him and ushered him right into, so he didn't get to the coat room, he ushered him right up to one of the pews, he's sitting in the pews, and wouldn't you know it, the minister's teaching on the Ten Commandments. And after the thing is over, the minister's in the back of the church, and this, this old guy comes up to the minister, he says, well, you know, I'm so thankful that you, you taught on the Ten Commandments, because my plan was, I couldn't find my hat, and I was going to come here and steal one. So the minister said, oh, so you're talking about the commandment of thou shalt not steal? He said, no, the commandment about not committing adultery. I remember where I left my hat. <laughs> Terrible. But a little, level, a little levity before we move on into more abomination of desolation here. The second temple. After 70 years of Babylonian captivity, obviously that temple was destroyed. So now, after 70 years of Babylonian captivity, Israel was allowed to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple area. We see this in Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, all those books talk about this time frame. Uh, and they were involved in rebuilding the temple area. Antiochus Ep Ep Epiphenus, Epiph Epiphanes. You can say it Antiochus or you can say Antiochus. You can say it, he, his name can be pronounced two different ways. And his last name is Epiphanes. 
<laughs> it is a lot. So the prophecy that Daniel is talking about is referring to this man. He was a descendant of one of Alexander the Great's Alexander, uh, he was a descendant of one of Alexander's generals. Remember, Alexander conquered the world. He died at a very young age in Babylon, of all places. And he left his, his empire to the four generals. This particular guy, Antiochus, is a descendant of one of those generals. And he, he's, uh, he's going to end up being the king of the Seleucian Empire in 175 B.C. to 164 B.C. He was famous for his brutal persecution of the Jews. The book of Maccabees tells what happened. Now, the book of Maccabees is, uh, are, are these books that in some of the Bibles are between Malachi and Matthew. We don't believe them to be God-inspired, but they are good books from a historical point of view. The book of Maccabees, Maccabees 1, Maccabees 2. The author of the book of Maccabees regarded the Maccabean revolt as... Uh, a rising of pious Jews against the Seleucian king who had tried to eradicate their religion and against the Jews who supported him. The author of the second book of Maccabees presented the conflict as a struggle between Judaism and Hellenism. The Jewish festival of Hanukkah celebrates uh, the rededication of the temple after this war that went on with Judas, Judah Maccabees' victory over the Seleucians. So the, the, they, the traitorous Jews, I'm quoting now from Maccabees, they, the traitorous Jews, said, let's come to terms with the Gentiles, for our refusal to associate with them has brought us nothing but trouble. This proposal appeared to many people, and some of them became so enthusiastic that they went to the king and received from him permission to follow Gentile customs. These are Jews. They go to this Antiochus, the Gentile king, and they had surgery performed to hide their circumcision. They abandoned the Holy Covenant. They started associating with the Gentiles and did all sorts of evil things, setting up our understanding, again, why there is going to be the desolation Here's the abomination the people of Israel were doing. They were turning away from Yahweh and they were, were going to league with the Gentiles. This was just like when the Babylonians destroyed the temple. Antiochus attacked the city of Jerusalem. He entered the temple and took away the gold altar, the lampstand, and everything that was valuable in the temple. He took it all and he brought it back to his own country. He also murdered many people and boasted arrogantly about it. There was great mourning everywhere in the land of Israel. Two years later, Antiochus sent a large army from Messiah against the towns of Judea. When the soldiers entered Jerusalem, their commander spoke to the people, offering them terms of peace and completely deceiving them. Then he suddenly launched a fierce attack on the city, dealing in a major blow and killing many of the people. He plundered the city and set it on fire and tore down its buildings and walls. Antiochus now issued a decree that all nations in his empire should abandon their customs, their own customs, and become one people. So he not only, Antiochus was not only over Israel, he had other nations that he was over also. And what he wanted to do was to have one kind of world religion, you know, one religion in his kingdom. And all of the Gentiles and, and even many of the Israelites submitted to this decree. They adopted the official pagan religion and offered sacrifices to the idols and no longer observed the Sabbath. So Israel forsook Yahweh again. The king also sent messengers with a decree to Jerusalem and to all the towns of Judea, ordering the people to follow the customs that were foreign to the country. He ordered them not to offer burnt offerings, grain offerings, or wine offerings in the temple, and commanded them to treat the Sabbaths and the, the festivals as ordinary work days. They were even ordered to defile the temple and the holy things in it. They were commanded to build 
pagan altars, temples, shrines, and to sacrifice pigs and other unclean animals there. They were forbidden to circumcise their sons and were required to make themselves ritually unclean in every way they could so that they would forget the law which Yahweh, well, the Lord, had given through Moses and, would di- and disobey all its command. The penalty for disobeying the king's decree was death. On the 15th day of the month Kisla, in the year 145, King Antiochus set, out, set up the awful horror of the altar of the temple, and the pagan altars were built in the towns throughout Judea. Pagan sacrifices were offered in front of houses and in the streets. <coughs> And the books of the law, which were found, were tore up and burned. Anyone who was caught with a copy of the sacred books or who had obeyed the law was put to death by order of the king. Month after month, these wicked people used their power against the Israelites caught in these towns. On the 25th of the month, these same evil people offered sacrifices on the pagan altar erected at the top of the altar in the temple. Mothers who allowed their babies to be circumcised were put to death in accordance with the king's decree. Their babies were hung around their necks and their families and those who had circumcised them were put to death. Many people in Israel firmly resisted the king's decree and refused to eat food that was ritually unclean. They preferred to die rather than break the Holy Covenant and eat unclean food, and many did die. In addition to all that was stated above, an altar to Zeus was erected, and sacrifices were to be made at the feet of the idol in the image of the king. And this is what Zeus looked like. He was placed in the temple, and they were to worship him and an image of the king. Again, we see the abomination of desolation. Their idolatry gave way to this horrific desolation. Now, the story of Maccabees goes on, and a lot of the faithful Jews rise up against Antiochus, and they defeat him, and they, they you know, overthrow all of this. But that's not really what we're looking at. We're looking at the abomination of desolation, that Daniel spoke about. Daniel spoke about what we, what he, Daniel alluded to what we're speaking about now in chapter 8 of Daniel. He talked about this that would come to pass, all that I just read to you. The next uh, desolation is the Herod's temple, and that's the third temple. <clears throat> the doorway for the destruction of, of the temple, obviously. I expressed in a previous session how vile, and in this session, how vile the temple of Herod had become with these evil men in charge who had crucified Jesus Christ. Uh, God's, plans, God's plan for man's salvation, they not only rejected, they killed. And um, so the abomination was pretty obvious, was apparent in the time of Herod's temple. And that Herod... That abomination set up for another desolation. There were three Jewish Roman wars that occurred. One in 66 to 73 AD. The second one, the Kittos War, was in 115 to 117. And then the Kokhba Kokhba War revolt in 132 to 136. These three combined correspond with the things that Jesus foretold. Which, by the way, I I didn't point out to you when we were going through the the destruction of the second temple that there were three events in which it happened. There were three things that occurred in in order. Remember, I did read, we did go over them, but I didn't point it out. There was three things that happened, just like there was for the the temple, uh, Solomon's temple. There were three specific things. And we'll see here that this is also what happened with Herod's temple. There were three events, these three different wars that ended up uh, where the abomination was total or the desolation was total. So uh, the first first war 
uh, in, se the, in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was overrun and the city was uh, badly damaged. Then the second war, the Quitos War in 115 to 117, really had no impact directly on Jerusalem. And uh, you can read this on your own and see what took place during that time. The third war was uh, in, it is this time with, um, um, what's his name? The Kokpa Revolution uh, that took place in uh, the 132 to 135. Uh, what happened, what, what triggered this was they had constructed a new city over the old Jerusalem, giving it a new name over the ruins of Jerusalem, and they erected in the temple area a statue to Judah. And as a result of that, of course, uh, you know, now the, this, is, this is, again, the abomination of desolation, very similar to what we've seen before. Here is the uh, worshiping of a man. When they, we looked at, we looked at uh, what happened with uh, Antiochus, he had them worshiping uh, Zeus, and they had him worshiping him. Now in this uh, 135, they had him worshiping uh, Jupiter, who is very similar to Zeus, just the Romans' rendition. So they're worshiping a god-man each time. It's a god-man that they're worshiping. And that is what will happen at the end also. Uh, this is an artist rendition of when Jerusalem was overrun during this war and all of the fighting that's going on. And this is, this is the, again, the, an artist's rendition of the statue of Jupiter that was placed on the Temple Mount and people were forced to worship. These, th these th so there's, there, again, there's three major wars and that set up the total annihilation, uh, desolation of Jerusalem. It didn't just happen in 70 A.D. The, the totality of it is, was in 135 A.D. These three major events centered in the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and all, all types of what will happen in the end of the age. What will happen is the beast will rebuild the temple in Jerusalem for the purpose of allowing Israel to again worship according to the Mosaic Covenant. If, if it was something that would happen today in our lifetime, as I said to you earlier, that, that the Jews are not able today to carry out the law of Moses because there is no temple. Where the temple area is, is a Muslim mosque. What it seems will happen is that, that, that the, the guy that's called the beast, the last tyrant empire the last tyrant of the great empire of the world, he will set up a temple in which the Jews can come and do their sacrifices, which they haven't been able to do all these centuries. And, and it looks he will bring in, in the first three and a half years of his reign, he will bring in priests and prosperity and all the rest. But then in the three and a half years into it, he will set up the abomination of desolation that will, or the abomination that will bring the desolation. And that is recorded in 2 Thessalonians. In, sec, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in uh, verse 3, it says, Let no one deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes, now re, here we go, he who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or the object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as what? Being God. He will be worshipped as a man God, just as Jupiter was worshipped as a man God in Herod's temple in Jerusalem at that time, just as Zeus was worshipped as a man God in the time of Antiochus. And Antiochus himself was worshipped as a man god. It's sort of ironic when you study Nimrod, the first world leader, talked about all the way back in Genesis, who started the first real empire, empire Nimrod, with the Tower of Babel. We'll talk about this more. 
But uh, it's believed, uh, Josephus and others believed, that he put himself up as God to be worshipped as God. So that the first one did it, and the last man will do it again. Opening up the uh, desolation that will follow. <coughs> Can you fix this for me? Then... Um, I talked to you earlier about there being five temples. I talked about, first of all, Solomon's original temple. And then 70 years later, the uh, Babylonian captivity and uh, Ezra and Nehemiah rebuilding the temple. Then Herod's temple. And then the end times temple that I told you would be built by the beast and then destroyed by the beast the final temple is where Jesus will rule the world. It's not going to be anything like the first temple, <coughs> for that matter, any of the other temples. He will rule the world from that temple. But there is another temple that we haven't talked about, which is extremely relevant to us. We today are the temple of God. We today, according to what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21, in whom the whole building being fit together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So we are the temple of God today. It talks about it in it talks about it in First Kings, I'm sorry, First Corinthians in <coughs> verse six. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, it says, Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside of the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, Therefore, glorify God in your body. We are part of the temple of God today. It's not a building, it's a people. The Holy Spirit dwells in us, God dwells in us. The first temple, Solomon's temple, we read the horrific things that transpired from Ezekiel, the, the abominations that they did, how terrible it was. And then we read uh, from looking at Maccabees, what transpired, how the Jews had forsaken Yahweh again, and how there was put this, this image of Zeus, and they worshiped that idol instead of Yahweh. And then again, we've seen with Herod's temple, the disgustingness that went on in what should have been God's holy place, and how they were so vile and disgusting, ending up putting a statue of Jupiter to be worshipped there. Today, we are the temple of God. How we conduct ourselves is either going to be similar to those of the past temples, or it's going to be the holy temple that God has always wanted. A place that would be holy and acceptable to Him. A place where He could connect with His people, and His people could connect with Him. A place where He would bring His holiness into our lives rather than our unholiness into our worship of him. Will we be like the past temples, or will we be the holy temple that he always wanted? I'm confident that that's the desire that all of us have, is to live holy unto him, so that he may get what he always deserved. But the end is coming, and he will finally get what he deserves. We'll look at more of that in the sessions that follow.